can one estimate some merits and choose machine learning and stuff like that. But the point is just nobody knows how to implement a hash function that satisfies this nice quality. But we can satisfy it roughly so it's called epsilon minimized when we have it satisfied with the cross mindset. And I also just want to say that this is used everywhere. Just the chaining and the probing, even though this seems so simple and so naive, you will find them everywhere in the industry. For good reasons. They're very safe. Especially the linear probing, as Hasper said, with the race car example, because of the sequential excess. Basically, the main cost is just to go into the table somewhere with the sequential excess for the element. If the run is not too long, uh, cost almost nothing. So you get to uh, do searches in memory for a key almost as efficient as just doing a single random.
that's the whole point here. You had this idea that for true domain and hash function, you couldn't do that for the whole p domain of the universe of keys because you consider that huge. But the characters, we have made c big enough that the character domains are small, and then we can fit them into very fast memory. So simple tabulation is, well, there might be other implementations, but on the computer side check, it was the fastest three independent hashes. It has that speech, which is like two multiplication. That's again because these tables were very fast, fast cache. Actually, on more modern computers, it seems like 16 bit characters work better. Then you have only half as many lookups, and the caches are getting really big. So there will only be two lookups for these 32 bit keys. And one of the things we see is it's not all independent. And that's very easy to see. You just look at the combinatorial combinations of two characters in each position, and you look at the hash values of these, and we just XOR them. And because you end up looking each uh, hash value exactly twice, and because x all, you know, when you add things to itself, it just cancels out as a zero, then we end up seeing that the x all of all the hash values is zero. So that means that if you know three of these hash values, you get the fourth one for free. So this thing with the dependence, in some sense, is a long question because the result I had with Mihai is that even though simple tabulation is not more than three independent, it can solve all these problems in one shot. And it's extremely fast. As I say, it's, I think it's about three times as fast as the best three independent schemes if you're, say, looking at 64 bit integers on the computer side. Uh, so, I mean, the scheme is well known. It goes it's used everywhere in, Excel, in um, operations research and stuff like that. It was recommended because it's uh, and I guess there were experiments to support it. Okay. But to prove that this works, you have to show that all this dependence you have in simple tabulation, we saw we got it as soon as we just looked at four keys, it's not harmful for what we're doing. So it's there, it's everywhere, but you want to prove that it's not going to kill your application. But if you replace the uh, exclusive all by addition, then... Uh, uh, then it also works. It, the exclusive all has some nice advantages. For example, it means when you look at the hash values, the different bits are completely independent of each other. So it does give some advantage. But actually, originally when we got our analysis to work only with division and not with the XOR. The XOR somehow is the fastest, certainly the thing the computers like the best, and it has a bunch of other advantages. But it works almost, you would have to go through all the proofs, but as far as I recall, there's nothing that doesn't work with addition or some, say, prime field. No. Uh, well, I'm actually not sure. Well, I don't think it's co-independent, but it may not be as, as bad as this case here. But again, we got this example very soon. It, it is not co-independent. Because in the example, if you add the numbers, they, they will always, always be even so you have to... That's exactly uh, right. Excellent points. You're a very good student here. <laughs> so, uh, Anyhow, so what I'm going to talk about, um, um, this again looks nasty first, you see it if you haven't seen it before, it's these channel bounds that are going to fall off the code. And the basic point is just we're, we're looking at in falls that we're hashing into uh, some number of bins that is not too small here. And then we have some query ball that we think is special because that's the one we're throwing in and we want to, what we're worried about is how many other balls do we collide with. Okay, if things were close to be random, then this query ball would just be thrown randomly and it would just be a random bin. But because we're dealing with hash functions which have independence, the position of the query ball could depend on the position of the other balls. So it actually matters uh, to see how many balls end up in the same bin as the query bin. And then we can say, well, how many things do we expect ending up in the query bin? Well, that's just the number of elements divided by the number of bins. So that's mu. And then we can say, ask, What's the probability that the number of things that end up together with the query bin divides, uh, deviates a lot from its mean? And we're here we have these standard channel bounds. It's almost standard channel bounds. The only exception is that the omega should not be there if it was a standard channel bound, and this thing should not be there. But otherwise, it's just the same bounds as if we have true randomness. This omega term basically just means that we have a delay. So it's like the channel bounds say that we that the probability that we deviate a 
by exploding mu, but just some small constant times mu. And I should be honest that the constant depends on the number of characters. And then we have this additive term, which is the number of bins in minus gamma, where gamma can be as big as you want. But it also affects omega. But you can basically think of this as being a kind of high probability. So with high probability, we get some delayed channel bounds. That's one way of reading this kind of thing. And basically, when you get channel bounds, that's one of the most important tools we have in randomized algorithms to prove that things work. So if you get channel bounds, a lot of things start working. So I'm not going to tell you how to prove the channel bounds. It's complicated, but let me just try to illustrate for you why tabulation hashing, simple tabulation, gives you something that's fundamentally different from anything you so we're just going to see what happens when you throw n keys into n to the 1 plus omega 1 bits. So we just have polynomially more bins than we have balls. And I want to claim that the number of keys ending up in the same bin is only constant. So nothing like that would hold with any constant level of independence. Here comes some obvious stuff, I get it. Uh, so the important part here is just that if we consider some set T of keys, then there will always be a subset of
thing and then they're probing, it was pretty easy to argue things because we don't care about what happens with just a constant number of keys. But with cuckoo hashing, you really have to be very careful because all it takes to kill cuckoo hashing is three keys that end up having the same two hash values. If that happens, we can't place them. So we have to worry about these small constant size instructions. So it ends up being a delicate proof. But anyhow, so the basic point is here that we get both linear probing, we get chaining, we get cuckoo hashing, all using the same scheme. And I should also say that because we have these, oh, this takes a while. Oh, sorry. Because we have these channel bounds, we also get that the highest load bin when we use chaining is log n divided by log log n. All these different things come out. And so I claimed it was quick, and again, I, I ran, it's a while back, I ran these uh, experiments, but it was just on a 32-bit computer and a 64-bit computer. And we have these really fast universal schemes, page multiplication and shift, and they are unbeatable in speeds. Uh, and again, you should only look at the same computer. Uh, so that's very fast. The two independent one, that was the one we talked about, was showing two W bits instead of just W bits. So it's certainly going to be slower. Uh, well, it's slower on this one here by a factor three to four, which makes a lot of sense because internally it's only doing 32 bit multiplication. So it has to be four of them. But here we see how simple tabulation is doing pretty well. If we wanted to do this five independent scheme, then I ended up using almost 100 nanoseconds, so basically 20 times as slow. Okay. So then it, it all, all depends on the computer. The kind of funny thing is, on this 64-bit computer, it doesn't make a difference if you use 32-bit keys or 64-bit multiplication, because it's just using 64-bit multiplication anyway in the rate steps. So that's the difference. But the basic point is just that simple tabulation works really, really fast. Okay. But what is far more interesting is to see what happens with something like linear probing. I mean, what happens with the theory? Mitzmark has a very nice result which says that it, it could have enough entropy. You just need something like you know, uh, two independent hashing for things to work. But there are plenty of cases in the real world where things don't have a lot of entropy. And we actually just took starting point something as simple as the keys being numbers from 1 through A. And in fact, that is a very real problem because that's what's used in denial of service attacks. They just look at consecutive IP addresses. So again, when we live in a world with a lot of computer-generated instances, they all have very small entropy, and then any theory based on high entropy falls apart. But on our hand, sometimes it does work. But so what we looked at was just what happened when we insert things with linear probing. Oops, I don't know what happened here. What happened when we inserted in the probing and I ran hundred experiments where each time I used a different range of C, but it's exactly the same input. And the slowest one goes on top. And if you look at things like universal multiplication shift, what you see is that most of the times it performs extremely well, but sometimes it goes really bad. Okay? And the same with uh, the two independent thing. It also really fast some of the time, but sometimes really slow. And what's really happening here is that Linear probing, if you just use two independent hash functions, an expectation takes logarithmic time, not constant as it should. But it's far worse than that. It's behavior something like 1 or x. It's the kind of behavior where most of the time it performs, it performs systematically good or systematically get bad. So most of the time it performs systematically good, there's no collisions whatsoever, and it performs much better than random. But then when it gets systematically bad, it gets horrible. So this one is going towards infinity. Okay? And, and this is really nasty because this is when the system down completely is when all these, uh, all the placements of different things in the hash tables end up with this quadratic performance. Okay. And so those schemes I have here, all the horizontal lines are the schemes that are supposed to work well in theory. And as you can see, they really have very reliable performance. Even all these 100 experiments, there's hardly a deviation. So here I have simple tabulation. And here I have, well, it's another version of five independent hash function. And here is the thing implemented with my same prime. But it's just nice to see how the theory pans out. But here, of course, I use a low entropy engine, input structure, input, but it's the same as when you do sorting, you do something like quick sort. Even though you would say you don't expect to have any problems because the probability that you get a sort list is zero, it happens all the time in, in real life. And the same thing here, it's also the funny thing that what really kills uh, many of these hash tables is when you try to hash uh, something that's already hashed in the sense What are the experiments? They're not just random, right? No, so, so the input is just the numbers from one to n in a large domain. And then I, I re 
experiment, I pick random seeds, right? So each hash function is defined by some random seed. So uh, most easily with the five independent hash function, you just pick these uh, five random seeds, and then you run a new experiment. And then you record your running time, and then I just solve, solve them so that the things in the top are those that are slow. So it's again, it's the same input, it's the same instance, it's just different random one, different random ones. Okay, so I think this is a very strong pitch for theory in the case of linear code, right? Because multiplicative hashing like this uh, multiplication shift thing and uh, also multiplicative hashing with primes, Cosmos had already earlier showed that that was uh, vulnerable. It's very unreliable under this typical denial of service attack where you just do consecutive numbers. I mean, people have talked about doing intelligent attacks, but this is some sense the most unintelligent attack you can come up with, and yet, and yet it really works. And it's really nasty because 95% of, of the time it works really good, and then sometimes really, really bad. And so the point is that these kind of problems are very hard to detect for practitioners because it's hard to know for them if they are just unlucky, right? They knew that they were given a randomized outcome, so sometimes they could risk having big but how can they know if it's a systematic problem or not? Okay. And especially it's also bad because if they want to say, oh, it's a problem in the algorithm, and they run it again, then it works perfectly because it's just one in 20 times it's going to perform badly, right? So normally when you go back to your system and saying, does this part work, does this part, part work, when you go and test your hash function, it works great every time. You just say, I don't know what happened, right? So this is really where theoreticians need to come in and help. Uh, and indeed, linear programming have gotten this reputation of being fastest in practice but unreliable, and then there are all kinds of ways that people have been de dealing with that at at and They had some alternative table formats that were switched to, but that means you have duplication of code, you have many more things to maintain, so it's really bad in practice to have to switch to another system. And the upshot of this talk is that linear probing is in fact safe with uh, at least the expected constant uh, time per query uh, for any input, but if you just do simple this is really the nice, comfortable thing. There's so many scandals where people use bad hash tables, hash functions, bad pseudo-random number generators. They get into big trouble. You do it when they try to generate codes for crypto, where you pick some bad primes that are easy to guess and stuff like that. And every time, the hackers will just say, oh, it's because you had a bad hash function. I know one that's much better. And then you try that one, and then one day it goes wrong, and then people laugh at you and say, oh, we knew that, but here's one that's much better, right? It's just this, and you never know when you can feel safe. But here you can feel safe. So simple hash function is, as I say, it's a powerful thing. It works for chaining, cobalt hashing, and minimized hashing. Well, some exceptions, so it's for almost all your needs. Okay. And the almost is why I'm going to continue this talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, something that we call twisted tabulation. So one of the nice things that make chaining and linear programming work really well uh, in many applications is not only that it works with an expectation for a single operation, but also, well, no, what makes it work kind of bad, sorry, is that if you look at square root n operations, then some of them are expected to take block, roughly logarithmic time, right? Several other, other speakers have talked about that the maximum pocket size is log n divided by log, log n if you use chain. And with linear probing, the maximum run length is an expectation log n. So that means that if you have a kind of real time system where you want to answer every query in constant time, then you're out of luck. You can write as well use a binary search. But if you have true random hashing, then what you can say happens with high probability is that any log n operations are dealt with in order log n time. Okay, so we can't give any promise for the individual operation, but as long as you're just looking at the amortized <coughs> number or the logarithmic number of operations, then you're down to constant time, and you can promise that. And why is this useful? Well, I was doing this for ATMT, which was, we're dealing with internet traffic, and what happens is that all internet routers have buffers, Backed up to a megabyte, so log n is easily contained in a megabyte in most practical cases. Uh, and then we can actually pro promise we get down to constant time operation. Okay. And this buffering is used, it also has some other advantages from a crypto perspective. You often don't want people to be able to know which keys result in a slow operation time because you can use that in attacks. But here we can just mask that because we can just uh, slow things down ourselves when we're too quick and then make sure we answer. So the problem is just here, there's a limitation for simple tabulation. I can construct input into 
take this alpha that we call a twister, and we X all that with the last character before we look it up. So again, without the alpha, this is exactly the same as simple termination, but we just have this extra alpha. And it's the same thing as in Python permutations that are used in crypto. And now, with that change, we end up having the twisted tabulation does handle every window in logarithmic time in high probability. And it turns out that this little twist has a lot of nice effects, cleaning up a lot of things associated with simple tabulation, and it's really fast. Again, this thing is just the fastest kind of operation we have on a computer, so it's only going to take uh, a fraction of a nanosecond. And just to sort of show the code, if you thought, if you didn't like the uh, other presentation here, so basically this is a code you would have for simple tabulation, but you just have an extra character uh, that you pull out, and then you turn. Just to sort of show you that the code for these things are really simple. It's something you can program quite easily. So one of the nice things we get with twisted tabulations are some complete channel bounds. I already claimed channel bounds, but I will now claim we get them much better. Uh, so we have these zero one variables uh, where we want each variable like variable xi to be one with some probability. And what we have is where true randomness is this exponential concentration around the mean. Uh, and so one of the basic things we use this exponential concentration for is that whenever we have a polynomial number of a logarithmic number of estimates, then they're all going to come out right with high probability. And that's how we use it in randomized algorithms. That's why we often have a lock parameter in these randomized algorithms. So if you want to implement this kind of thing with hashing, what you do is just that you use a hash value which is a, well, uniform in zero one, maybe with some precision, and then you say that you sample the guy uh, xi if the hash value is less than pi. Okay. So if you only have bounded independence, the issue here is we only get polynomial concentration. So again, if we had full randomness, we get exponential concentration, but the, with k independence, we can't guarantee anything but polynomial concentration. But with twisted tabulation, we get the same formula as before. There's this little difference in here that says the universe up to any constant size. And so the difference was the simple tabulation, what we essentially would get would be that you would be replaced by the number of bins. But the number of bins, if you're just tossing a coin, it's just there are only two choices, then you would have some constant uh, in some constant, and then this term would completely dominate everything. So what we ended up with is having that this error bound or the high probability bound is in terms of the universe size and not just the number of bins. And there's a similar situation with minwise hashing that's work we did with Bill Sam Dalibor was here, one of my students, which is that the simple tabulation, the bias we get is actually a beautiful small, but it's small in the sense of that if the set is large, the bias is small. But here we then get that the bias is small compared to the universe size and not the set size. So again, we can trust that, that we get minimize hashing uh, with small bias even when we're dealing with small sets. And again, we try to implement these different schemes. And they, I think the basic point to take home from here is just the twist the tabulation is only marginally slower than simple tabulation. And I think one of the other interesting things is you can use twist the tabulation as a as a very fast pseudo random number generator. So, what happens is that when you want to use so any hashing scheme, can be used as a pseudo random number generator because you just hash one, then you hash two, you hash three, you hash four, and so forth. And the point is, it's only the least significant bits that change. So, instead of having to look up all the different characters, you only have to look up the least significant character each time, and that's why it's blistering fast. So, comparing that with random from the C library, it's almost six times as fast. So what's the difference here is now you get a pseudo random number generator that is six times faster and it actually has the right distributional guarantees that allow you to do statistics and stuff like that. I mean, it should also be good for integration, basically any kind of connection where you use pseudo random numbers. Okay. Uh, Plasma have some nice results for pseudo random generation, but certainly this thing here is also going to be quite powerful. So, I'm dividing the lecture in two, sort of naturally. So 
that's something that is always bothered me is this thing that uh, we teach Quicksort as one of the first things in the course of randomized algorithms. It's a very beautiful algorithm. And it says in each step, you need to pick the next before because you just gave, generate a pseudo random number. So you have some array you want to pick a random before from, and you just use a pseudo random number to say where which one should be the before. Gives you the index of the next before. And, and the issue here is just that there's all kinds of crazy dependencies. So we actually don't know how to implement such a pseudo random number generator that makes that work. And it's a problem for many, many randomized algorithms. We have this concept of, in the same way as statisticians say, you throw the next point, we say you throw the next random number. And the point is just there's all these correlations between the decisions you made in the past, how the, in the quick sort thing, how the search tree developed and stuff like that. And we don't understand that. We don't understand how if it's possible to generate random numbers that make these kind of arguments work. I'm talking about convex or all kinds of things. But twisted seems to have some proof. And uh, yeah, then very recently, and I hope it still works, <laughs> it seems to work most of the time, uh, me and my students, uh, Sam Dalsbaugh, as he mentioned, Matthias and uh, Eva, uh, we have been working to prove that, it, that this simple tabulation also works Okay, my 
see is a constant. This is huge independence, the size of the universe, is a volume in the universe. He uses C as a constant, constant time, and he uses this much space. Uh, and to formulate more or less what I said here, we think of both T and C as constant. He gets omega 1 independence, maybe this much, in all of one time using this much space. So I use so that's all the best we could hope for. Oh, that was a negative thing, and then this corresponding positive thing. Sorry, I, what I said made nonsense. So he gets this high independence from constant time, using this much space, but he can pick epsilon high very more. So epsilon is just one divided by C. Okay. And then you also write that it's far too slow for any practical application. So with double tabulation, that uh, we get the same independence as here, but we only use this optimal C time, right? This is this time bound we talk about here, using this much space. And we can, in fact, also get what is really the optimal independence. That's a little hard to prove, but it's true. And using this much time, and again, with the same amount of space. So that's what we're going to get with double integration. And as I said, it was fast to slow by the fact of application. Our speeds are very simple, but the analysis is So again, what we had was this simple tabulation thing here. We saw this bit point and it did not work. We now claim that simple tabulation is expected to yield some very fast, unfinite, constant degree expansions. So expansions are some important area often relevant to randomized outcomes and stuff like that. And we actually get in some sense the best unbalanced expansions known. And that also applies, and when we apply it twice, we get this high again. How can I even talk about where do I see this unbalanced expander? So it doesn't have to be simple tabulation. We just think of any function that maps with keys into B characters. Okay, you can think of any hash function that's hash value. Normally with simple tabulation, we talk of the key as being divided into characters, but we can also talk about the output hash values as being divided into, say, eight bit characters. So how do we define the unbalanced bike search graph? We say that the right-hand side consists of these position characters, which is both the character and the position in the in the hash value. Okay, so if we have some function, so this is this function here, it gives me B characters, then the neighborhood of the key X is just each of these output characters together with its position. Okay, so it's kind of trying to illustrate that. We have on the left-hand side, we have the universe of all the keys, and each key has B neighbors, and it consists of a character and a position so in some sense, we're dividing the right-hand side into B different parts that we separate. So it's the same thing with the last one. Michael talked about uh, splitting the table. It's this kind of thing. Okay. So the theorem is that if we use simple tabulation and things are divided into P C characters, and we now produce hash values which are 12 times longer, so they consist of 12C characters, then with probability, which again depends on the size of the alphabet, what happens is that for any set which is not too big, the neighborhood is not B times bigger than the set, but B half times bigger. And that's the classic definition of an expander, which takes sets up to this size. And for comparison, the best explicit unbalanced expanders that are known, they use at least logarithmic here we get down to constant degrees, unbalanced expanders, and, and, and that's typically what we want in most expander context is getting down to constant degrees. And all these things, when you start thinking of putting in numbers, it will sound horrible, but I will try to tell you something better later. But for now, I just think of these as theoretical bounds. So at least the probability of error is small. is 
going to be such a unique neighborhood that, yeah? Is this figure, so where do we see the unique neighborhood? There, there are also uh, black edges going into that cell? Or? Oh, that's not the cell. So, very good question. And uh, again, yes, also everybody asks questions, please. So basically what they just did was that I took my right hand side which was a set of all output position characters and divided it into the output position characters at position zero, those at position one. So here we have the whole alphabet different characters in here which are all at position two. So this is not a single element here. The other ones map over here. This one is only one that maps to this particular one. So we have again the full alphabet different characters inside this song. But I should have made that clear before. Okay. So why is this so relevant? So again, we get this uh, unique neighborhood expander, and the point is that this is a feeling that Michael, Michael and uh, Rasmus have been using before is that if we have a function that's k unique. And now if we have a random simple tabulation function that takes, again, B characters and map into some domain, then when we compose the two things, we get something that's k-dependent. And it's very much the same argument as we had before. The point is, how does simple tabulation work? Right? It takes, when we have the px, first we get B different output characters. And then we look up all these output characters and get some random XOR all these values. And the point is, X will now be the only guy who has this output character in the first round, and hence which uses a random value associated with that output character by the second simple tabulation function. So that means that the hash of X is independent of the hash of everybody else. And then the feeling says that it's K unique, it says that for any set of size at most K, you have a unique output position character. So now we can peel away X. And then, by definition of it being k unique, it means that in the new set we can also find a key which has a unique character, which gets a unique random value. So now the hash of y is independent of what remains, and so forth. So the corollary is double tabulation, which first takes my c keys and maps into b c characters and maps into b characters, and then another set into the domain of hash values, then the composition is independent with some universal probability 1 minus the law of 1 over y. Okay. And what do we mean by universal? The point is that I just need one k unique function. And when first I have it, I can regard it as constant. I never need to change it again. So that's why I mean it's universal. This guy only has to be done once, whereas the second simple tabulation function uh, has to be tossed each time we want uh, something which is independent. Okay. So, as I said before, many of these things look pretty horrible, but it is also hard to get good constants in the closed forms. There are many things to paint loud and stuff like that. So I actually tried to do the calculations and would say 32 bit numbers divided into 16 bit keys. Uh, I, that I ended up with something 100 unique with probability 1 to 1 minus 1.5 to 10 minus 42. So this is really going to be 100 unique with very high probability in practice. So claiming that if you have a USB flash drive with random bits, that that represents a universal k unique simple tabulation function, that's going to be the safest part of your hardware. I mean, it's much more likely that there are other problems in your hardware than that. So in fact, you can just take your flash drive, fill it with random numbers, and say this is the magic function you always goes for, and you are very, very safe. So the proof of this kind of thing is, I don't think I want to really talk about that. That's just, it gets a little bit subtle. You can look at these violations, which are a little bit like these trees the other guys have been talking about. And yeah, I will not really get into that. I just uh, say that this sequence high dependent by any practical application. And now we have the simple alternative, which is exponentially faster, and which also gives these fast unbalanced expansions. And what I also want to say is just this thing, the simple twisted and double tabulation, they only need a pointer to some randomly configured memory. Right? So from parameter, you just have to say, from this point onwards, we have some randomly configured memory. And we never need to change that. So for multiple systems, this leave the cache clean and it's efficient for any kind of concurrent processing. And one could even imagine uses a special cheap and fast randomly 
themselves don't have to be truly random. They just have to be taken at that point. Okay, so you can use your polynomial uh, with these k different coefficients and use those to the pre-processing phase to fill in all the different tables, and then everything will work. But so now the big question is sort of like it would be a painful one for many men how to answer in connection with this workshop, but the question is really who has to take this in passion? Right? Because everything we've talked about in this workshop is how great it is to have passion because we can do past uh, And one thing we should never forget asking ourselves is uh, is it possible to, to maintain a dynamic set of keys which is preserved in the new keys and ask if something is there in constant time? Worst case trivial chain allows you to do everything in expected constant time. With the Google hashing, the query time is always constant because you just look at two position. But the update time uh, can easily end up being logarithmic because you have to follow these cycles around. So the question is really, do we need all this randomness? I mean, if we could, yeah. So again, we want to both insert and look up keys in constant decreasing time. Deletions are easy. And so the best out of bound is square root of log log n to be the worst case. And that's actually tied for a much more general problem, which is the predecessor problem. So the predecessor search problem, if you have a bunch of instances you have stored, when you do a search, you don't just say no if the thing is not there. You say what's the nearest key to what would be the predecessor if you had things stored. Okay. And for that problem, it's even a static law bound. Especially if we, from an out 